So, G Money, I got uh, Team USA versus China on in the background. How many people in China do you think have to pick up a basketball before they find uh, someone with some handles who can actually play point? I can name one. He's playing for, uh, I believe, the uh, Guangdong, uh, what the, I think the Beijing Ducks right now. It's called Stefan Marbury. I think <laughs> the, uh, the viewers have, uh, have seen him before. Stefan Marbury is not Chinese, though. Doesn't matter. He plays in China, so there you go. To the fast break, you're joined by Master Wu and G Money. We call him G Money because he's an accountant. G Money, how are you doing this Sunday evening? I'm trying to stay cool since the uh, the temperatures have hit exactly 100 degrees here in New York City tonight. Well, I like the fact you finally got that freaking Knicks poster <laughs> off the back of your room. <laughs> Is it? Oh. Well, I, I, I don't know what the poster you're talking you're, about. You're, you wouldn't uh, see me caught dead in a New York Knicks uniform. You got a Knicks Guarantee. poster right behind you. What are you talking about? We, we don't, we don't, uh, is that visible? You got, you got to edit this out, <laughs> you, by the way. What a hypocrite. But this is the team I root for, baby, right here. <laughs> what a king hypocrite. All right, before we get to our topics, do you have a quick Jeremy Lin comment? Let's get that off out of the way real quick. I just like to comment on his hair, his latest hair change. It looked like uh, the Velociraptor. I, I would have to uh, disagree with that. I think uh, he, just, he I, I know he likes to change up his hair every once in a while, but come on, this, this hairstyle, the AI hairstyle, just doesn't work for him. I mean, I'm not trying to be racist or anything, but it just doesn't work. The look French good on him. Rose don't didn't work on, on Brother Lin. No, I don't think. I think he, he he's just he's just trying to be different. I don't know what he's trying to do, but if you look at the press conference that the Nets had introducing all these new players, everybody else looked pretty professional. Uh, they had the good suit, good tie, you know, good haircut. Jeremy Lin stood out like a sore thumb with his hair and his earrings. I don't know what he's doing. Uh, he, maybe he's trying to bring in a new fan base or something, but I don't think it just, it just doesn't work for him. There are there are so few Asian males out there getting any attention. Uh, any attention he gets, I don't really care. No, he's already getting a lot of attention. He doesn't need any more attention. He's already bringing on in a whole new group of fans to the Brooklyn uh, community. So I don't understand why he needs to do this. He needs to go this extra step. Well, for our Jeremy Lin fans, there will be plenty of Jeremy Lin coverage. Uh, throughout the NBA season, but let's start things off with the big news. Uh, G Money, uh, Hillary Clinton has a running mate, Tim Kaine of Virginia. He's basically done everything in Virginia: city council, mayor, lieutenant governor, governor, now a senator. Sixty Minutes. I don't know if you saw, but Sixty Minutes just aired earlier tonight. The first joint interview with Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine. And I have to say, what a difference. And I don't know how much of it is edited and because it's not the raw interview, but I don't know what a difference between this interview and the Donald Trump, Mike Pence interview. This one had, it looked like it had so much substance. It looked like two people who were on the same page talking about topics as opposed to Trump and Pence, which honestly, let's, let's be real. That was almost, it seemed to me kind of like a ventriloquist act. You know, Mike Pence looking over. Uh, what do you think about what I had to say? Donald Trump nodding. Yeah, that's a good answer. Whereas Hillary and Kane seem to be jumping in, sort of supplementing each other's information based on the questions. They were laughing at each other's answers. Uh, so I, I, I actually think this pick. At first, I had no idea who Tim Kane was before he was a senator. But the more I see, the more I think the Democrats will like this selection. Uh, I think a lot of. The Democrats are saying that Tim Kaine uh, is a safe pick uh, for Hillary Clinton. Uh, Hillary didn't want to ruffle any feathers. She just wanted to play it safe. Down so down. Hillary actually let Tim Kaine speak in this interview. That is uh, <laughs> pretty amazing. You actually want to let your vice presidential candidate uh, say what's on his mind, uh, unlike Donald Trump, who basically cut uh, – cut uh, his running mate off every single time he wanted to speak some, uh, say something. So I think Tim Kaine w is serviceable. <laughs> but a lot of people a, a lot of people are saying that uh, Hillary Clinton is playing not to lose instead of playing to win with this pick. And uh, I, I think uh, I think she thinks she has it in a bag. Well, from an analyst's point of view, I like it. 
uh, because uh, I, he's from the swing state of Virginia. The fact that he spoke fluent Spanish, and I actually tried to look up to see who was the last vice president or president who actually spoke more than one language. And I think you have to go all the way back to FDR to find someone who spoke more than one language. So the fact that he speaks Spanish, I think, is another huge plus. Yeah, I, I thought that Hillary would have uh, locked up the, uh, the the Spanish vote. I mean, I think a lot of uh, Hispanics, you know, and, uh, and Latinos are, are are leaning more towards Hillary than Donald Trump. I'm, I'm hoping. And it's probably it's probably in the bag anyway. And then the other big news: uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the chairman of the Democratic National Convention, has said she will resign from her job after the convention. After uh, I guess their servers got hacked, and WikiLeaks leaked out some documents showing that she was not playing it down the middle and that her and her people were thinking about how to undermine Bernie Sanders during the campaign, specifically addressing his religion. I don't know about GUG money, but I am shocked. The chairman of a political party taking sides and not playing it down the middle. OMG, what is going on? This is politics. It's not supposed to happen. I am so shocked, G money. I can't believe it. I couldn't believe the news when I heard it. Well, this election is just uh, it, it just uh, weird all around. It's not like a normal election. I mean, it just feels it's. I got this weird vibe. I mean, there's a lot of uh, sides being taken. I think uh, we just have to see how it plays out. But uh, generally, I would just say this election is just not like any other election I've been a part of. Anything else you want to add with the uh, Democrats before I move on to some of the Republican stuff that went on this past week? Well, the Democrats just uh, their convention hasn't. Uh, is uh, coming up this week. So we, we would have a lot of uh, Democratic uh, stuff to talk about next week. But I want to get into the Republican National Convention, what happened, which happened last week. And there is a lot of things to talk about. I think we should start with the very beginning, the first day with Melania Trump, uh, Trump's wife, uh, her speech. What did you think of her speech? And uh, how would you interpret the whole plagiarism thing? I think the plagiarism thing is a small piece of a much bigger puzzle. Did she take it? Well, I'm going to roll this 30 second video and let you judge for yourself. Of the the values, values that you work like, hard for what you, you work want hard in life. For what you want in life. That your word is, that your, your, word bond, is your bond. You that you do what, what you say, say you're going to do. Keep your promise. That you treat people, that you treat people with respect. With Dignity because and respect, and because, because we, want we want our children, children and all in children in this nation to know that, to know that the only limit to the height of your achievements is the reach of your dreams, dreams and your willingness and your to work hard to for, work them. for them. Was it her fault? She didn't write it. Yeah, she, she, but she says she did on her interview with, I believe it was Matt Lauer on the plane, like a few hours before her speech. She blatantly said, and I quote, I'm not plagiarizing this. I quote, <laughs> I wrote most of the speech. I don't, I, don't, I don't believe she did. I mean, do you really think she was sitting at the penthouse of Trump Tower on YouTube looking up Michelle Obama and then like, oh, ooh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe yeah. she's a fan of Michelle Obama. You never know. Maybe she's a big fan and she wanted to just emulate the previous first lady. Well, she was a fan. Here's what happened from the Trump staffer that ended up accepting responsibility, and she offered her resignation but said the Trumps said, uh, no, thank you. We're not going to accept it. She said she was on the phone with uh, Melania, and they were and Melania was telling her about some of the people that she liked, and one of the, one of the people was uh, Michelle Obama. So, Michelle, uh, so Melania reads part of the passage or part of the speech from Michelle Obama, and the speechwriter jots it down. And, but she never went back to check to see what Michelle Obama actually said. So it sounds like she jotted it down and forgot to change it, and it kind of just got through. Maybe. Well, first of all, I think the Trumps needed a fall guy, right? No, nobody in, the, in Trump's uh, inner circle are going to admit it's their fault. They want some fall guy to say, okay, I, I, uh, I made a mistake, and I tender my resignation. Trump didn't accept it, so it's, it looks like he would be the good guy in that situation to make him look better. So I think, uh, I think either way, I'm, we know for a fact, I think everybody knows and everybody thinks that Melania Trump did not write that speech. I mean, it, it's pretty obvious. And secondly, I think Trump is just trying to defuse the situation. It's funny to, 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 uh, to see how other people, you know, trying to defend this. Chris Christie, 
Cook, who uh, apparently he's not too upset about not being uh, made uh, vice president nominee. Uh, he he, based he said, uh, Melania Trump did not plagiarize ninety three percent of the speech. So that seven percent it was plagiarized, but ninety three percent was not. So I think it's pretty funny to see how everybody uh, tries to defend this. Well, I agree with ninety three percent of what you just said. <laughs> No, here, well, here's what got me. If they just cut, and here, and here I think is public relations 101. If they just come out the day after and said, oops, it was a slip up, this person did it, everyone would have just moved on to the next thing. But they kept denying it, denying it. It's just words. Michelle Obama doesn't own the English, English language. And it was, she. It, the thoughts were the same. It, it's just coincident. I, it's just, and then, and then the day after they turn around and go, oops, maybe someone did slip up somewhere. Yeah, because it was made a big story as well as should. It was made a bigger story than they thought initially, and uh, it's it just when they first said it, you know, they were just covering up something. How can it be just few words when it's basically word for word, like the same sequence in which she said it, see, and Michelle Obama said it in her speech. So it can't be just okay rhetoric where uh, you know we're talking about family values and stuff like that. Of course, you can talk about family values, but you have to take it word for word from another person. Uh, I think there's just so many more important things. I actually didn't like the fact that it was focused on that much because there's so many other things to talk about. But Can we talk in, about Ted Cruz? In, in the grand scheme of things, Melania Trump isn't going to play a huge role in, in this administration should they should he be elected. But yes, let's go. Let's move on to Ted Cruz, who who I don't understand for the life of me. Why why let Ted Cruz speak unless he tells you he's going to endorse you? So Ted Cruz goes up there and he does what Ted Cruz does. And that's basically stand in a corner and do basically what he wants. And what that's why no one apparently no one likes him in the Senate. And uh, so he goes up there. He gets cheered at first. And then the crowd starts to boo because he won't <laughs> say he endorses Trump. He won't say vote for okay. Trump. Instead, he tells people to vote your conscience. And then Donald Trump uh, decides to walk in towards the end of his speech and upstage him. And uh, Ted Cruz is essentially booed off the stage pretty much. And uh, the day after, he doubles down and says, and you know what? I kind of I kind of understand and I kind of give Ted Cruz credit. He's betting on Trump failing. So four years from now, instead of finishing second, maybe he can finish first. And let's 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 call a spade a spade. When, when someone calls you lion Ted a million times, when someone calls your wife ugly, when someone says your dad perhaps had something to do with the JFK assassination, how hypocritical would it look if you turn around a couple of months from now and said, you know what? I'm on your team. I, I kind of respect Ted Cruz a little bit by saying, no, I'm not going to tell you I endorse you. Yeah, I, I think this Ted Cruz, uh, where was this Ted Cruz during the election? I mean, I, I think Ted Cruz during the primaries, I mean, I think Ted Cruz uh, stuck to his values. I mean, he didn't waver. I mean, he's not going to all of a sudden become Trump's lapdog. Uh, like a lot of Republicans are doing. I know some Republicans didn't even show up to the convention. Like the Bushes didn't show up, and you know, uh, Romney somebody, didn't show up. Yeah, uh, Romney didn't show up. A lot of uh, you know, re, uh, poli politicians on the Republican side didn't show up. So, uh, Ted Cruz, I this is what this is what I expected from him. I mean, when you put him on that stage, he's not going. He he didn't say he was going to endorse Trump beforehand. Trump uh, acted like he was surprised that he didn't endorse him. I think I thought I think they just put him up there, hoping that you know. Uh, trying to pressure him into endorsing Trump. It didn't happen. And this is the result. He got booed off the stage. But I got to say, I, I like Ted Cruz uh, a lot better right now. Well, I, I, like I said before, I think he's betting on Trump failing because if Trump somehow wins the election, then Ted Cruz is finished. But if if uh, if Trump ended up ends up losing, I don't know where the Republican Party goes from here. All the establishment candidates have been run out of town, essentially. They got smoked wasn't even close in the primaries by two outsiders. And if Donald Trump doesn't come back next uh, four years from now, maybe Ted Cruz is the leader in the clubhouse when it comes to uh, 20, 2020 when that rolls around, if Donald Trump doesn't win. If Donald Trump wins, yeah, I think Ted Cruz is done for. But if Donald Trump loses and loses in a big way, uh, Ted Cruz may not be looking so bad. Who, who was it that said that uh, the like George Bush was going to be the last Republican president ever? I mean, I, I heard somebody say that. I forgot who, who it was, but I have to agree. If Donald Trump loses this election, that's it. The Republican Party can essentially, uh, it's already collapsing uh, as we speak, but essentially it will be gone if Donald Trump does not win this election. Any, any other takeaways you had? Because it was a long rambling speech. I don't know, LG, and Trump, 
and Trump will go down in history as the first president to mention or press candidate to mention at a convention, the LGBTQ community, which is quite ironic because last I checked, I'm not sure how many, how much of that vote he's getting, but it seems like it would be a, a minuscule amount. But, uh, I, I don't know. I, he I just, mean, it, it was just a lot of promises in that speech. I'm not sure. I, I heard a lot of specifics besides that. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And we're going to do this. And we're going to do that. You know, make America great again. Make America strong again. Make America, you know, uh, all, all these slogans. But no specifics. Uh, I heard no specifics. Like I never heard any specifics from Trump. I mean, it wasn't a surprise. Her spe- his speech was just a bunch of rhetoric. And uh, hopefully... I mean, I, hopefully he mentioned something about policy in the general election because he certainly hasn't uh, mentioned anything about policy up until now. All right. Any other things with the Republican National Convention before we move along? No, I think uh, that's about it. All right, G-Money, our next topic. I want to talk about something that I heard from uh, the new newest New York Nick point guard, Derek Rose. And I almost choked. I almost choked on my cornflakes when I heard this. Uh, I don't want to get it wrong. Here's the exact quote during an interview with the uh, NBA.com. Here's part of the quote. I mean, with these teams right now, they're saying us and Golden State are the super teams, and they're trying not to build that many super teams. And Adam Silver came out with the statement and this and that. Uh, G Muddy, I don't know. Is Derek Rose blocking out the last four years of his life? Uh, who in the world called a? Who in the world called the New York Knicks a super team? And B, I don't know how he's going to compare the Knicks to Golden State. I would take any of the Golden State big four: Draymond Green, Steph Curry, uh, Clay Thompson, KD. I take any of those four before I take anyone on the Knicks. So, I, what did you think? I I didn't know what I didn't know what to think. My mind was confused when I read Derrick Rose called the New York Knicks a, a super team. Well, first of all, this was going to be my what the hell for the week, but uh, you just uh, took it away and we made a topic out of this. But I think, uh, I think, uh, first of all, Derek Rose might com- might be a little confused about who, which team he's playing for right now. I think he secretly w- thinks he's playing for like the Cleveland Cavaliers or something, and they're calling themselves a super team. But uh, on an- on another side note, uh, this got me thinking about. Uh, Tim Duncan's retirement recently. Tim Duncan uh, might be the last player that went out the same way he came in. He's always professional. He's always quiet. He goes about his business. Now, recently, these players who came in to the league, very likable, very quiet, goes about their business. For example, like a Derrick Rose, like a Kevin Durant, all of a sudden, something and then just changed. I think Derrick Rose has been saying a lot of controversial things uh, within the last few years, especially since he got hurt. And, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people in Chicago were accusing him of not playing uh, when he was, uh, when he could have played in the playoffs. Kevin Durant recently, obviously he's, he's been uh, mouthing off to the media uh, and basically hates the media right now. So I think Tim Duncan, I respect uh, a lot of what he's done and his whole career, and but the most important thing is his character. The character that he brought on and off the court never changed in his how many years he played, like 19 years he played in the NBA. So I really respect him, Duncan, after I heard some of these uh, other players mouthing off and uh, you know changing their personality basically throughout their career. I have high hopes for D Rose. I, I wish to God this becomes a super team, uh, but for now, just get me to the playoffs. I think the Knicks have no. Uh, if if Derrick Rose and Joakim Noah and uh, you know all those guys stay healthy, I have no. I mean, Porzingis stays healthy. I I, I fully admit that the Knicks are uh, a playoff team, but we have to see. I mean, Rose hasn't been healthy uh, for a full season in forever, so uh, let's see what happens. All right, let's move on to one of our final topics. Uh, this is going on in baseball, and it's uh, causing a lot of waves. Ace pitcher Chris Sale of the Chicago White Sox, who's uh, he's had previous run-ins with management, so perhaps no surprise. He was very unhappy with a throwback jersey he was supposed to wear, and I think he asked to be let out of it or, and to not wear it, and basically they said no. So uh, before the game, apparently he went all Edward Scissorhands on the jersey, sliced it up, 
and they basically said go home. And now he's been suspended for five ga- five games. So I think he'll miss a start. Uh, is Chris Sale just being a big baby here? We know when Adam LaRoche earlier before the season started, when Adam LaRoche was told you can't bring your son around the clubhouse anymore, he basically you know slapped management in the face by putting a LaRoche jersey by his locker. What do you think about Chris Sale's latest antics? I mean, Chris Sale has just got a I, – I don't understand. Maybe he just doesn't want to play for Chicago anymore or whatever. He's just upset with management. So I think, uh, you know, he, maybe Chicago's not giving enough run support. Maybe Chicago's losing too much. Maybe he's frustrated. But this is not the way to take it out. Uh, I mean, you're just letting your teammates down. So Chris Sale, I, I believe he's just acting like a spoiled child at this point. I would suspend him for a month. I mean, I, it's not like the jersey had anything inappropriate in it. If you're in any other job, if you work at a Walmart, if you work at an Old Navy and they tell you this is what you have to wear, then you get up and wear it unless it's some, you know, it's unless it's some offensive. I don't see what the deal is. If, if it looks ugly, it looks ugly. But guess what? You don't own the team. You work for the team and the team has a right to tell you what to wear. Yeah, but he said it was uncomfortable. How's I don't get why any uh, any jersey would be uncomfortable. I th- I think it's the same size, right? It's not like uh, all made in yeah. China anyway. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I don't understand what his beef is. Maybe he's just finding an excuse to not play. Maybe he's just uh, trying to find an excuse to let management know that he's unhappy. Let's move on to our final segment. It is what the heck or heck yeah. One of us will bring up a moment or something that's happened this week that makes us go, what the heck? And then the other person will have something that make us went heck yeah. So let's start off with your what the heck, G Money. Well, my what the heck has to go back to a previous topic, the Pokemon Go. Uh, I I understand that some people are very into this, and I think most people are into it, but can you explain why reporters are playing Pokemon Go uh, at a White House uh, at, at, at a White House briefing on ISIS? I don't understand that at all. As the Secretary said earlier today, though, and I think it's an important reminder, you're playing the Pokemon thing right there, aren't you? I'm just giving you a minute. It's an important reminder. We know this won't be easy. We recognize it's a challenge. Did you get one? No, no the signal is not very good. I'm sorry about that. Some reporter was called out by the uh, person uh, d- doing the briefing on ISIS at, at the White House, and then uh, he was playing Pokemon Go on his on his phone. I have I have absolutely no defense for that. I would never do something like that. I don't I, I don't play it at all. But even if I did, I wouldn't do it at a press conference, much less one about ISIS. Was the press I conference agree. that boring? I mean, come on, you, you can't wait like a few minutes. The press conference is not going to last that long. I mean, I don't know how long it lasts, but can't if it's one hour. I mean, can't you just get off your phone for an hour and just pay attention? I I I, I agree that guy. If I was that guy's boss, he's going bye bye. Well, I, I don't know if he was mentioned, uh, or I don't know if his name has been thrown out there, but definitely uh, he, sh- he should be uh, reconsidered for uh, the job. Uh, certainly something that would make you go, what the heck? All right, G-Money, my heck yeah segment of the week. I don't know if people noticed this weekend, but uh, two players that we saw growing up were inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame, Mike Piazza and the kid, Ken Griffey Jr., who I hated because he would destroy the Yankees so bad he could do everything. He could hit the long ball. He could get hits. He could field. He had a great arm. Also loved his personality, MVP, the one guy you can count on who smacked all those home runs, and you know he did it clean. I only wish he never got hurt so that he could have broken the home run record. And did you see what he did at the end of his speech, G-Money? Uh, I didn't catch his speech. At the end of his speech, before he said thank you, the signature Griffey look. He took his hat out, popped it on backwards, the same look that he made famous, and I almost freaking dropped a tear when I saw that. Griffey Jr., pretty amazing that he hit all those home runs, even though he was hurt for a better portion of the second half of his career, I believe. So to, to make it to the Hall of Fame, uh, basically playing only half a career is, is pretty amazing. Uh, I, I, it kind of dragged on a little bit so, so he could get up to, get to 600 homers. But uh, I think he was fine until uh, at some point, he, I think late in the Mariners' career and when he went to the Reds is when he really started to break down. I remember him uh, signing that big contract with the Reds. He never lived up to it because he was hurt all the time. 
But to get the 600 home runs, even though he pretty much didn't play uh, a lot of games uh, the second half of his career, I, I would find uh, pretty amazing. Mike Piazza, a great uh, Los Angeles Dodger, great New York Met, uh, also deserved, well deserved. I mean, one of the best catchers of all time. So uh, to play the catching position and to be hitting all those home runs, great offensive player. So congrats to both. And uh, I, I, those are the good days of baseball, I got to tell you. Any other final thoughts before we head off of the week, G-Money? No, I think that's about it. All right. We'll see you next week, everybody. Peace. Peace. Signing off.